so to start off with, I put two frogs on this one slide because they're incredibly similar frogs. Physically, you basically can't tell the difference between them. Mating call is the major way of distinguishing them. And also the location. So the eastern sign-bearing froglet, which is also known as the Murray Valley froglet, is found upstream of Walker's Flat. So into the Riverland, down as far as Walker's Flat. Sometimes in flood events, some of them may get washed down and occasionally we've picked them up around Goolwa, but typically you're only gonna find them upstream of Walker's Flat. Downstream of Walker's Flat and also across to the west and into the eastern states, you get the common froglet. They're, as I said, they're both very similar looking, but they're really variable in their skin color, in their texture. They're always earthy sorts of colors. So you get them in grays and browns and creams and rusty reds. And you get some which are all one color, some which are striped, some which have defined patches or spots, some which are just blotched in different colors. Some of them all one color, some of them combinations of these colors. And the belly is usually made up of these black and white spots, sometimes almost like a zebra pattern, but really spotty. You can almost imagine if you've got a photograph of a zebra print, which is so big, and on your computer you expand it to be massive, as you expand it, it's gonna get really pixelated, so it's gonna get really chunky. That's what the pattern on the common froglet and the eastern sign-bearing froglet belly looks like. And typically the males have got a, a dark throat, which is sort of a dirty brown color. They lay around, around about 100 to 150 eggs in small bunches attached to vegetation in the water. And they're not very, very big, growing to around about three centimeters in size. Eastern sign-bearing froglet, Cunia parensignifera. common froglet, Crinia signifera. One of the largest frogs we have in the region is called the Eastern Banjo Frog, which is also known as a Pobble Bonk or Forbob Frog. It has a scientific name, Limnodynastes jumeri, and Limnodynastes basically means Lord of the Marshes. This frog is one of the largest frogs in the region, growing to around about eight and a half centimetres in length. And it's quite easy to distinguish from all the other frogs because of those large glands on the back of the legs, which are called tibial glands. These frogs can produce a milky poison which is secreted out onto the skin if they are attacked by predators. And it's designed to taste really bad. So if they get it in their mouth, hopefully they'll think it doesn't taste very nice and they'll spit the frog out. If you get this poison in your eyes, it does sting. It feels a little bit like someone has got a needle, heated it over a flame and is jabbing in and out of your eyeball. And because frogs are adapted to living in fairly moist environments, this poison is designed not to wash out in water. So if you do get it in your eye, you can't just rinse your eye with a bit of water to get it out. So it can be quite painful. So the recommendation is if you come across this or any other frog, if you do pick it up, don't go putting your fingers in your mouth or rubbing your eyes or any other part of your face until you've given your hands a really good wash with warm soapy water. The females in these frogs develop flaps on their first two fingers, the thumb and the next finger and they use these when they're mating. So as they mate, the male is hanging on around her waist and she will lift her arms alternately up and out of the water and then down again. And basically what she's doing is using those flaps of skin to grab some air and she's pushing that as a bubble through the water and mixing it in with her eggs to create a foam nest that floats on the surface. She lays around about 4,000 eggs. 
The mating call they make sounds a little bit like a loud bonk, which is where they sometimes get the name Pobble Bonk, which I'll play for you now. And typically each male makes a single bonking noise. So if you hear a bobonk or the pobble bonk, that's actually two or more frogs making that noise. The male just makes one note. This is a photograph of an eastern banjo frog taken near Piwala wetland. And as you'll notice, it's puffed up. These frogs can often use this defensive posture to try and threaten predators to scare them away. Basically saying, I'm a big fat frog, you leave me alone. And you may also notice on the back foot, there's actually a large, looks like a plate on the sole of the foot. This is called a metatarsal tubercle, also known as a spade foot. And these frogs use these to help them dig. They're a burrowing frog spending most of their life underground and they will dig down in a spiral motion. So here's an example showing you the frog going down backwards into the soil with the dirt falling down on top of it. And again, you'll see the tibial gland on the back leg, which is that poison gland. Another frog in the same genus Limnodynastes is the long-thumbed frog, sometimes called the barking marsh frog. These are very closely related to the spotted marsh frog, which we'll talk about in a little while. One of the easy ways to distinguish them is by the rose-colored patches above the eyes. So on what you might call the eyelid. They've got that pinky rosy sort of color. And typically they have sort of a butterfly shaped patch between those eyes. And they may have a yellow or white stripe running down the back. Often they don't have a stripe. When they don't have a stripe, that butterfly pattern does stand out a bit more clearly. And I will show you another photograph in a short while, which gives you a really good example of that butterfly patch. The name long thumb frog comes from the fact that they've got long bones in their thumbs. I'm not quite sure the reason for having these long thumbs, but obviously it serves them some purpose. They're quite a widespread frog found in Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria, but in South Australia they're restricted just to the River Murray system throughout the length of the river and some of the associated swamps and wetlands. As I said, they're sometimes called the barking marsh frog, and that's because of the call that they make. So that whack, 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 whack sounds a little bit like a dog barking in the distance. And I think you'll agree, between the eyes, it does look quite a lot like the silhouette of a butterfly. Here's the spotted marsh frog, also known as a spotted grass frog. Similar sort of size, growing to about five centimetres, with or without the stripe running down the back. They typically are sort of green or brown spots on a grey brown body. And they're interesting because if you find them during the day, they tend to be really dark and you can hardly see the spots at all. But at night, the back goes really pale and the spots really stand out. And I'll show you a photograph in a minute which will describe that quite well. Males tend to have sort of a lime green throat and the rest of the belly on both males and females is really pale. Again, they're a frog that lays a foam nest in the Limnodynastes group, so they do that whole arm moving thing with those flaps of skin. There are three different types of spotted marsh frog in South Australia, and they've got the names Southern Call Race, Western Call Race, and Northern Call Race. Quite descriptive, the Southern Call Race ones are found down south, so around Mount Gambia, and then into Victoria. The northern core race is found throughout the Murray Valley and up into the northeast of the state. And the western core race is found in the Adelaide, Adelaide Hills area and over into the Flinders Ranges. There is a little bit of a hybridisation zone where the, they meet up. So you can get a little bit of a mix 
of the species. The core of the, the southern core race is very different to the northern and western ones. So down south you get a just a single little click. Sounds a little bit like a couple of rocks being tapped together. The western core race and the northern core race a little bit different. So I'll play you the northern core race first. Spotted grass frog, Limnodynastes tasmaniensis, northern core race. Spotted grass frog, Limnodynastes tasmaniensis, western core race. Machine gun is what a lot of the textbooks say it sounds like. Yep. Which I think is quite apt for this frog because it looks like a soldier in camouflage gear. So you can imagine this little soldier hiding in the grasses making this machine gun noise. And coincidentally, the collective term for frogs is it's an army of frogs. So you've got a pride of lions, pot of whales, an army of frogs. All these little soldier frogs with their machine guns blasting away. So do you reckon you've got a good enough description to separate the northern and western of those? Yeah. The last one sounds more, um, they sound more wooden. Yep. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Like southern and western. Yeah. If you listen really, really carefully, you'll also tell there's a slightly different number of pulses in the core. So the western core race is a little bit slower, a little bit deeper, and has extra pulses compared to the northern one. But it's really hard to tell without visually looking at the recording on the computer. But it's one of those where you'd, you'd listen to it and you might go, I reckon it's this one, but I'll just open it up on the computer just to double check to make sure. It's especially if you're right at the edge of the region, but if you're way over in the Flinders Ranges, you'd go, oh, it's the western. So here's some more examples of photographs. So you can get them with and without the stripe. It's not related to gender at all. Sometimes people would say, if it's got a stripe, does it mean it's a boy? No, males and females can have a stripe. Males and females can be unstriped. I relate it a little bit to hair color in humans. Sometimes you get people with red hair, sometimes brown hair, black hair, sometimes no hair. It's the same with these guys. And as I said, typically during the day, they tend to be really dark, you can hardly see the spots, and at night the spots really stand out. What's always confused me about this photograph, which was taken during the day, is why this one decided to stand out. Typically you'd think it's because it feels comfortable in its surroundings, doesn't feel threatened, but I've caught these frogs and stuck them in a plastic bucket. But there you go. Now so typically females are larger than the male, so a bit longer and a bit fatter because they've got to get all the energy to produce all of those eggs. And that's what the foam nest looks like, just floating on the surface of the water. So it looks a little bit like detergent or foam with little black dots in it. It tends to go a little bit dry and crusty on top and this may help to protect the eggs from water loss and also UV radiation. The whole mass underneath is really sticky. It's a little bit like the consistency of snot. And you may think, why on earth do we have this snotty foam nest? This is going to help protect the eggs from predators like little fish. So if you imagine a little fish swims along, comes to these eggs and goes, oh, yum, I'll eat those eggs. As it goes to grab hold and, and try to suck one of these eggs away from the nest, the whole sticky, snotty mass will move with it. So it makes it really difficult for a fish to pull out an individual egg. So collectively that's going to help protect those tadpoles, those little embryos, as they develop before they hatch out. And in most Australian frogs it's around about a week between being laid and the little tadpole hatching out. So it's a nice little protection for them for that short period. 
One of the frogs which a lot of people think is one of the really cute ones is called Ewing's tree frog, also known as the brown tree frog. Why is it known as the brown tree frog? Because they're brown. Down in the southeast of South Australia, you can get green ones. And you can get ones which are all green or they can have green stripes or green patches and mixed with brown. And I used to get people ringing me up saying, I'm in Mount Gambia and I've got this frog in my garden, can you tell me what it is? And I'd say, well, you need to give me a bit more of a description than that because you've got quite a lot of different frogs down there. And they'd say, it's about five centimetres long. I went, okay. I said, does it have pads on the fingers and toes? And they go, yeah, I think it does. And I'd say, brown tree frog. And they go, it's green. They go, okay, in that case, it must be brown tree frog. <laughs> and they go, no, 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 it's green. I said, okay, you've got a brown tree frog. And they go, but down in the southeast, you get green variations of them. All the ones we find up around the Adelaide Hills and the Murray tend to be these brown colours. They can be anything from a really pale cream right through to a really dark chocolate brown. They can change shade. They're not instantaneous, so they're not like a chameleon that goes yellow, purple, green, blue. They would change between the light and the dark, depending on their mood, and trying to blend in with their surroundings. So if you're a, a really pale cream coloured frog on a dark brown log, you're going to stand out, so they would change shade to try to match their surroundings. <coughs> They've also got these markings on the back of their legs, which tend to be orange or red with little black spots. And they're probably a form of flash coloration which is designed to protect them from predators. So when they're sitting really still, they'd have their legs tucked in, and they'll be sitting here like this. If they get attacked, they would jump. They're really good at jumping. As they jump and they stretch out their legs, they will flash this colour. And the predator may think, ooh, black and red, that's poisonous, I'll leave it alone. Or they may think, ooh, that's the colour I'm looking for if I want to eat this frog. As soon as this frog lands, hopefully in dry leaf litter, it'll tuck its legs back in again and try to blend in with its surroundings. The predator will be busy looking around for that black and red, won't be able to see it. Hopefully for the frog, it'll give up and go away and then the frog can make its, go about its normal business. So flash coloration is basically a special sort of camouflage. It says, now you see me, now you don't. That works really well for a lot of predators. These frogs are quite often when we find them, they're in fairly still water. You don't get them through a raging river. They typically like things like pools and dams, though they can make use of some of the streams as long as they're not flowing too quickly. And they seem to have this trick where if the water quality is good and there's lots of water, they lay lots of eggs. If it's not quite so good, they lay just a few and then they'll move on somewhere else and lay a few more. So I guess that whole not putting all your eggs in the one basket type of situation. These frogs typically start breeding or start calling towards the end of April, May and then onwards. So they're quite active at the moment. I live at Bridgewater and when I go for a walk around the block, they're calling all over the place. So yeah, growing to about five centimetres in size. They always have this dark stripe running from the across the nose through the eye to the shoulder with the bit of pale or white underneath it. So no matter what colour their body is, they've always got this stripe and that probably helps to mask the shape of the eye. So if you imagine an almost white frog with a big black eye, predators will be going, oh, there's an eye, that's what I'm going for. But having this darker stripe helps to blend the shape of that eye, makes it a bit less visible for them. The mating call is a it's quite high pitched. Some people absolutely hate this call of this frog. I don't mind it, but I don't like having it right next to my bedroom window because it, it can give you a little bit of a headache. Brown tree frog, Victoria Ewing Eye. That's a species that a lot of people 
send in recordings of crickets and they go, oh, we got all these frogs. And I listen to it and go, I'm like, yeah, no, no frogs. So people often confuse them with crickets, but quite high pitched, rapidly repeated. Although often when the males first start calling, they'll do much, a much more low energy call. And I liken it a little bit to humans. If you're a guy and you're trying to get the girl, you could go all expenses, fancy restaurant, jewellery, flowers, or you could go, see if I can get away with a cheeseburger at Macca's. <laughs> if that works, great. If it doesn't work, then I'll put a bit more effort into it. So often when they start calling, so if you hear that, it is a brown tree frog, but it's just a guy going, least amount of effort, see how I go. Being a tree frog, they're quite good at climbing. They've got the pads on the fingers and toes. During breeding, males get these dark patches on the base of their thumb. It's called a nuptial pad. It's actually a sticky little pad which is designed for hanging on to the female. So it's a little bit like he's glued himself to the female. I'm not going to let go. Sometimes other male frogs will come along and try to dislodge a male that's mating with a female so that he can have a go. This sticky pad helps the first male hang on so he doesn't get dislodged by the female. Another tree frog that you get throughout the Murray Valley is called Perrin's tree frog. This is an interesting frog because it's found in the Murray Valley in South Australia. It's found in a few isolated swamps in the southeast and it's quite ex extensively distributed in the eastern states. In the last 10 or 15 years or so, it started popping up all around the Adelaide and Mount Lofty Ranges region. We've had it at Unley, we've had it at Kapunda, we've had it at Ingle Farm, all sorts of different places. And we think the reason that it is spreading is because of the pet trade. So these frogs and tadpoles are often available from pet shops, and pet shops will often say, Parents tree frog from South Australia. And people think, oh cool, this is one of my local frogs, I'll get some and I can stick them in my pond. And they'll breed and then they'll spread. Which is great for the frog, not so great for the other frogs in the region because these ones are a bit bigger than many of the other frogs, growing to about six and a half centimetres. And if you've got a six and a half centimetre frog that comes across a two centimetre frog, what do you think is going to happen? Meal time, yum. So they, they could actually pose quite a problem for many of our small native frogs. So as beautiful as these frogs are, they're not a frog that we want distributed throughout the Adelaide and Mount Lofty Ranges region. We've been getting quite a lot of recordings of these frogs through the Frog Spotter app. So it just demonstrates again how good the Frog Spotter app is at helping us track some of these frogs. And we would be able to track things like the cane toad if they came into our system. So the parents tree frog tends to be these brown and grey and black mottled appearance. It's got little green spots all over its back. I'm not sure if you can see that in the photograph. And in the groin and on the tops of the hands and feet is bright yellow with black markings. Probably serves a similar purpose to the red and the black in the brown tree frog. They're a frog which has got a pupil in the shape of a cross. So they're really easy to dis distinguish from the other frogs. And typically during the day, they'll hide behind the loose bark in gum trees. So especially in some of the swamps and along the, the edge of the River Murray, you'll get them hiding in that loose bark. And also if you've got poles around jetties and boat moorings, which are hollow, you can get the little frogs hiding in there. I was at the Swamport wetland and I walked to the mooring of one of the boats and I just had a look down and there were about five or six of these little parents tree frogs staring up at me saying, mm, don't eat me. Their mating call is amazing.
Yeah, so a lot of the textbooks describe it as a maniac or a maniacal cackle. I usually describe it as something like a crazy witch in the swamp. You can imagine this witch there with some sort of cunning plan, rubbing her hands away. Beautiful frog, amazing crawl. I used to keep these as pets, and I had some of them for about 18 years before they died. And every time they called in the tank, my dog would be looking up, saying, what on earth is that noise? Quite a, a beautiful little frog. But again, a, a problem with it spreading throughout the region. One of the iconic species in the Murray Valley is the southern bell frog. This is a frog which is protected. It's dis described as vulnerable in South Australia. It is about the largest frog that we get in South Australia, growing to about 10 and a half centimetres. One thing I didn't mention way back at the beginning is when we talk about the size of a frog, we're measuring from the tip of the nose across the head and body to the backside. We're not measuring the length of the legs just that head and body length. So these ones, about 10 and a half centimetres. The tadpoles also grow to around about 10 centimetres in size, so they're quite massive. Colour varies from a really bright green through to a dull olive or brown, and they've got turquoise on their thighs and on their feet. I'll show you a photograph of that in a second. They're voracious cannibals, so one of their favourite foods is other frogs, and they don't care what species the other frog is. So they could eat their own kind, they don't mind at all. In fact, we, when I was at university, we had a couple of these in a big tank and they'd been in a tank for many, many years. There was a, a male and a really large female, been happily sitting there together. One day I walked into the lab and there's a big fat female here with these legs <laughs> going down into her mouth. She decided to eat her partner. Why she decided to do it that day? Who knows? But they're quite happy. So she got really big and fat. We had one less frog. But that's how it goes sometimes. They used to be found in parts of the Mount Lofty Ranges. Between about 1960 and the mid-1980s they were found. We believe they were introduced into the region and they have since died out. We've had frog monitoring programs going on since the early 1990s. They've never been picked up in the Mount Lofty Ranges region. They're still found in the Mur Murray Valley and the southeast, but their numbers have declined over the years. This is one of the species that a lot of the work has been done in the SA Murray Darling Basin to try and protect. So how far south do they go in the Murray Valley? All the way to the mouth, yeah. And they're found right down to Mount Gambier and, and below and then across into eastern states, and also in Tasmania. So quite a widespread species, but not as abundant as they used to be. The mating call? Southern bell frog, Latoria raniformis. Painted frog Neobotrachus pictus. Neobotrachus means new frog, pictus means painted. These are another burrowing frog going down backwards in that spiral motion. They've got a black spade foot on their foot, designed for digging. They've also got vertical pupils. So this one and the next species are the only ones with the vertical pupils in the region. So shaped a little bit like a cat's eye. A really easy distinguishing feature. Growing to around about six centimetres in size and they typically are these olive yellow colours with the darker markings. They're not normally specific defined patches so they don't look like big spots or patches, they're just sort of colours bled through the rest of the body. And they lay around about a thousand eggs in a long chain. So as the female is laying the eggs and the male is hanging on she will swim through the water between the grasses and the reeds and the sedges with this long stream of eggs behind her in a, in a nice chain. The mating call? 
painted frog, Neobotrichus pictus. As I said, being a burrowing frog, they go in backwards. In that spiral motion, dirt falling on top of them. These are one of the frogs which would traditionally have been used by Aboriginal people as a source of water in the desert. So these frogs can go quite a few metres underground, maybe as much as six or seven metres underground, and they store lots of water in their body. So they've got pockets of, of holding water under their skin, and they also store quite a lot of water in their bladder. So they would burrow down underground, and they would just sit there and wait till the rains come. Now these frogs can be found in some of the most arid parts of South Australia, and it may be five, six, seven years between rainfall events. They will stay underground all that time, just waiting. As soon as it rains, they will come up to the surface. They will replenish their water. They will feed and they will breed. And then they'll go back underground again. And sometimes that can mean they're active for only one or two nights before they go back underground, waiting till next time. If you're an Aboriginal person or somebody else who wants to get the water from these frogs, how do you go about doing that? The trick? Stamp on the ground. As you stamp on the surface, that's going to send vibrations through the soil. To a frog a few metres underground, that is going to feel exactly the same as heavy rain hitting the surface. So they'll feel these vibrations and go, oh, rain, time to come up. So they'll come up to the surface. Then you can bend down and pick one up. And if you give it, give it a little bit of a squeeze, not too hard, just a gentle squeeze, it's going to do a wee and you can drink it. And some people go, frog wee, that's disgusting, no way. But if you're in the desert and you've got no source of water, you're going to die of thirst. Drinking wee from a frog could save your life. And I always say, you don't take all the wee from the frog, just take a little bit let the frog go, it can go back underground, because chances are, if you're walking through a desert, at some point, you're going to come back. You might need to get another drink, in which case you can trick the frog to coming back up again. Beautiful frog. They've also got this nice trick of inflating and doing the push-ups to avoid being eaten. And this works really well against some of the smaller predators. So creatures like the egrets and herons with the long skinny beaks and the long skinny necks, they may see a frog like this and go, whoa, too big, there's no way I could eat that. If I tried, I'm going to choke on it. So they would leave it alone, frog can go about its business. But if you're a bigger predator like a kookaburra or maybe even a pelican, nice big beak, nice big mouth, you might see one of these big puffed up frogs and think, oh, I can eat that, that'll be a nice meal. If one of those predators goes for this frog, this frog has got another trick that it uses to avoid being eaten, and it's pretty good. <laughs> It'll jump and scream. And if you're a predator, what are you going to do? Fly away. Works really well. Works really well against humans as well. I was down around Mount Gambia, and I found one of these frogs, and I thought, oh, they puff up when they get attacked. I'd love to get a photograph of it. It'd be really useful for talks like this. So I thought, if I poke it on the nose, it might think I'm a bird, and it'll puff up, tell me to leave it alone. So I poked it, and it puffed up. So I think, great. Got my camera, went to take a photograph. It sat back down again. So I thought, got to be quicker. So camera in one hand, poke, puffed up, went to take a photo. Before I could get it all in focus, sat back down again. So I thought to myself, I've really got to razz it up. Maybe if I poke it six, seven, eight times, it'll be a little bit more scared and stay puffed up. So I bent down, and after about the third poke, it screamed at me, and I leapt backwards and collapsed on the ground, and I'm going, ah, ah, ah. And then I went, hang on. These frogs are only about five, six centimetres in size. Even when they're puffed up, they're not that big. Take a breath, calm down, and go have a look. And it was... Still there like this going, oh my, click, I managed to get the photograph. <laughs> but when it screamed at me, it did scare the willies out of me and I jumped out of the way. 
Screaming frogs, it's a great way to avoid being eaten. If you just scare the bejesus out of something that's not expecting it, it works really well. Now, these frogs are hopeless at jumping, which is why they puff up and scream, but their webbing is really good for swimming in the water. So a lot of the areas like the, the clay pans, once they fill up with water, the water hangs around and they need to be able to float and swim around without drowning. And again, you can see during breeding season, they get the dark pad on their thumb. And in this species, they also get dark spikes over their body as well. And these frogs will actually wrestle with each other like little sumo wrestlers. So maybe the spikes are useful for that. And in this species, the males are often larger than the females because if you're a big sumo wrestler, you've got a better chance of winning than a little one. Now, another very, very closely related frog is Sudel's frog. Looks very similar to the painted frog. It's normally covered with darker patches which are much more defined than that random bleeding that you get on the painted frog. And another characteristic is they've got webbing between their, the side of their body and their knees, which gives them a sort of baggy pants appearance. So sometimes they're called the baggy pants frog because of that. The mating call is quite similar to the painted frog. So those people who thought woodpecker, how would you describe this one? Sudel's frog, Neobotrachus sudeli. This one it tends to be a bit of a deeper call and a lot more staccato, so it's a duck, 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 duck rather than a sort of noise. Painted frog is a little bit more high pitched, but this is one of the frogs that if, if I got a recording of this or the painted frog, I might go, I really need to double check and cross reference this with another one. They can be really difficult to distinguish. And in some parts of the Murray Valley, you do get both of them at the same site, which can make it doubly hard to identify them. So the, these are a very tricky frog to ID. Here's a little juvenile one. This was taken down around Beachport in, in the southeast. Again, really highlighting the defined patches on the back. And this is not a tongue. It's actually an earthworm. So this little frog is trying to eat an earthworm. This frog was about so big. The earthworm was about that long. So I was sitting there watching it for quite a while. Took lots and lots of photos, but eventually I went, I've got to go. I can't sit here and wait for it to finish eating this worm. But a lot of people think frogs have got really long tongues. They don't. Frogs have got quite short tongues. So if you ever see pictures of a frog flicking out its tongue to catch things flying around, that's rubbish. You never see a photograph of that. You can see cartoons. Frogs do not have a really long tongue. They can't stick them up. They can't curl them. Frogs actually keep their tongue folded over inside their mouth and flick it out. So it comes forwards and down. They can't stick it out to the side or up in the air. And the last frog in our list is a frog called Bibrin's toadlet. The scientific name Shudophrony bibrini basically means false toad named after Bibron, another one of these French explorers. They look very similar in appearance to the little froglets, the eastern sign-bearing froglet and the common froglet, but these guys have got much shorter, stockier arms and legs and stubby toes and fingers. Their belly does have a bit of a zebra pattern, but it's quite a defined, smooth pattern as opposed to those little spots or pixelated image of the froglets. Again, growing to around about three centimetres in size. The interesting thing about these frogs is they don't lay their eggs in water. Instead, they lay them on the ground, usually in leaf litter or a bit of a soggy depression. And the tadpoles will start to develop inside the egg. So they don't hatch out into the water. They grow inside the egg. And they would do that until the point where you'd normally expect a tadpole to start growing its arms and legs. When they get to that point, they just stop and they sit there in suspended animation waiting. 
if everything goes well, rains will come and flood the area and then the tadpole will hatch out and finish its normal development in the water. If rains don't come, the eggs will dry out and the tadpoles will die. They're quite specific in their habitat requirements. They need to have an area which is subject to flooding for that life cycle to occur. This has caused them a problem because over the years, quite a lot of the habitat where these frogs would be found has been destroyed. A lot of landholders who've had these areas which get really boggy or flooded in their property, they go, I don't want this horrible swampy area. I want to make use of this for my agriculture. I'll drain it so it ma makes it useful to me. That has taken away the habitat for these frogs. So these frogs are now classified as rare in South Australia. They are a protected species. You're not allowed to do anything to destroy their habitat. You're not allowed to collect them from the wild. They're a beautiful little frog. Another little trick they've got, if they get attacked, they tend to run down a little network of tunnels in the grasses. If they're out in the open and they can't get to one of these tunnels, they'll flip over on their back and go floppy and still and pretend to be dead. And if you walk up to one and flick its arms and legs, they will just flop around and the frog will stay there, waiting for you to go away, hoping that you won't try and eat it. And this is a trick that they use against lots of different predators. So many of the birds that eat these frogs, when they see a frog on its belly, they may be thinking, this frog could be dead. Why is it dead? How long has it been dead? Is it disease? Has it been poisoned? Will it be safe if I eat it? Maybe not. And also colour markings like black and white in nature are often a sign of being poisonous or distasteful. So they'll see this frog go, looks dead, looks poisonous, I'll leave it alone and go and eat something else. As soon as danger is gone, these frogs will flip over and then scurry away like a little mouse. And we've had this sort of frog in the field where we've um, en encountered it and it's flipped over on its back and then we just stand there with a stopwatch and go, I wonder how long it'll stay here. We've had them well over half an hour on their backs while we've been standing. As soon as we turn around to walk away or if the torch goes off, they'll flip over and off they go. So pretty amazing little frog. And what sort of areas do you find them in South Australia? Um, you find them in some parts of the Flinders Ranges. You can find them around Norton Summit, Watts Gully, some of those um, scrubby areas with creeks which are dry for most of the year but f produce lots of depressions. You can get them up around Bel Air as well. So they're quite nice little spots. And they've also been recorded as making a nest inside of hoof tracks of horses and cattle in the past as well. The mating call is quite unusual because in most cases they make a single note and it may be 30 or 40 minutes before they make another note. So they can be really frustrating frogs to work on. As a field researcher, one of the ways that you often find to collect frogs is to listen to their call using a process called triangulation where you may get three or four people to stand spread out and you stand in the dark with your torches turned off and as soon as you hear a call, you shine your torch where you think it came from and hopefully where all the torch lines intersect, the frog is going to be somewhere near there. And you, what you might do is do that, take a few steps forward, turn your torch off and wait for it to call again. Now with this frog, it might be 30 minutes before it calls again. And then you eventually get over and you go, okay, it's going to be in an area this big where all the torch is intersecting. I'll just see if I can find it. But as soon as you start to disturb the grasses or the leaf litter, what's it going to do? Run down one of these tunnels and make its escape. So you'll be there going, I can't find it. And you give up and you walk away. And typically, as soon as you walk away, they start calling again. Really, really frustrating. So this recording I'm going to play for you, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of noise coming from it, but there's actually lots and lots and lots of frogs because each one is making a single note and it's big delay before it makes another one. Bibrin's toadlet, Pseudophony bibrini.
probably about 20 or 30 frogs in that recording. So each one goes and then waits when the other frogs call 20, 30 minutes later, calls again. It's quite amazing. How would you describe that? Could you distinguish that from a common froglet? One of the tricks for this call is if you listen, right at the end, it increases its pitch. So it goes, it goes up at the end. Whereas common froglet tends to be more flat in its call. But they're very, very tricky frogs to identify by their call. Because they look a lot like a common froglet. They're often found in similar locations to a common froglet. But as I said, short stocky legs, and they often have these orange markings on their head, around their sides, and especially down around the groin. Short, stumpy frogs. Okay, so that's all the species of frog from the Murray Valley and the Adelaide Mountain Lofty Ranges region.